Humeral shaft fractures. This is from the OTA core curriculum resident lecture series version 5. Slides are by Dr. Christopher Sugalski and I'm Sakib Rahman narrating. Objectives here are going to be to go through the following. Understand the anatomy and surgical approaches. We'll talk about a lot of that uh, information in this first video. Uh, understand the indications for operative versus non-operative management of humeral shaft fractures. Uh, understand the use of functional bracing. Um, try to help answer the question of whether to do open reduction internal fixation versus intramedullary nailing and understand the literature. Uh, also understand uh, MEPO technique and the literature behind that. Uh, to develop a strategy for treating extra articular distal third humeral fractures. And we'll cover that in the last video uh, of this slide deck, uh, as well as um, how to manage radial nerve palsy in the setting of humeral shaft fractures. So a lot to cover. Uh, a little bit about epidemiology and classification. Like many fractures, there's a bimodal distribution as shown uh, in this figure here uh, with younger trauma patients and then uh, somewhat older osteoporotic fractures. With the AOOTA classification, uh, the humeral shaft is uh, bone number one, uh, region number two, so it's a 12, so it's 12 A, B, and C. Uh, like most diaphyseal fractures uh, shown uh, as in the diagram here. So the anatomy, of course, is very important to review, uh, especially your uh, radial nerve course, uh, as it uh, will be very important whether you're doing open approaches, even intramedullary nailing. It's really uh, important to understand where exactly the radial nerve is, uh, depending on where you're working. So. Um, another important thing is that the medullary canal ends proximal to the olecranon fossa, so well above the joint line. And when we think about tibia nailing, uh, femoral nailing, um, you know, you, you oftentimes will, you know, have an intramedullary nail that can get pretty close to the articular surface, certainly at the proximal tibia, distal femur, uh, and uh, when you nail a proximal femur as well. You're not at the articular surface, but you're sort of can go to the, you know, end of the uh, canal, so to speak, uh, or the end of the bone. The canal goes to the end of the bone uh, at the piriformis fossa. But a lot of times people don't realize with the humeral shaft, you can't put an anterograde nail all the way down to the joint surface, nor can you do a retrograde nail. So when you have when you have fractures in the supracondylar region or fracture lines that get there or close to there, um, intramedullary nail is not uh, really valid. So um, the radial nerve travels medial to lateral uh, and is directly posterior to the shaft at the mid-diaphysis, and it's often in contact with the lateral shaft distally. And fracture alignment is determined by the location of the fracture relative to the major muscle attachments um, most notably the pec major and deltoid attachments. And that that's what can create some uh, deforming forces. So uh, here's an example of fracture uh, distal to the pec major and proximal to the deltoid tuberosity. So you can see sort of how you can create potentially some uh, angulation due to those two deforming forces and adduction of the proximal fragment. Uh, if it's hard to see, the proximal fragment is here. And the distal fragments there. Um, another example is a fracture distal to the deltoid tuberosity. Okay, and in this case, the proximal fragment will be abducted and there'll be shortening at the fracture site. So, here, a little bit hard to see. Here's your fracture fragment and uh, your other fragment, a little hard to see, but it's there. So, there's going to be some shortening and proximal fragment is abducted. So here's a great review paper if you get a chance to look this one up. A little bit older, but um, it really talks about anatomy, so that hasn't really changed a whole lot by Dr. Dan Zlotolo. If you want to check this out in the JAAOS, JAAOS, yeah, um, 2006. Uh, and here it, they give you a nice sort of chart of uh, the distances um, that you need to reference where the radial nerve is given any bony landmarks. And here's a couple of them here for you. Of course, this can vary a little bit depending on the size of your patient. Um, 
this stuff comes up on test questions also, so it's good to know. All right, we're going to talk about surgical approaches. Uh, we'll start with anterolateral approach. So this is from Rockwood and Green, uh, and if you have, uh, uh, if you go on, go on over to ota.org, and uh, you're able to get online trauma access uh, with your membership, then you can get access to Rockwood and Green online. So here's uh, an example of uh, the um, anterolateral approach uh, demonstrating uh, essentially uh, an extension of the deltopectoral approach proximally. That's right. So you have the, here you can see that uh, interval with the pec major medially, deltoid laterally, and then distally you expose the brachialis and then what you can do is essentially split the brachialis down the middle um, and the brachialis is dually innervated so you kind of come down the middle and that gives you a nice exposure of the um, mid to distal humeral shaft. You may have to detach a little bit of the uh, pec major and the uh, deltoid in order to get access to the shaft. Here you can see an example of 51 year old male transverse humeral fracture um, undergoes uh, open reduction internal fixation, uh, brachialis split, anterolateral approach. You can see a mini fragment plate holding the reduction, and then a uh, what looks to be a 4.5 millimeter um, compression plate um, with slight under contouring due to the transverse nature of the fracture. And you can see it's positioned anterolaterally, okay, between the uh, deltoid and pec insertions. And to do this, you do have to elevate a good amount of uh, deltoid uh, to get that plate all the way over there. So again, at the ota.org website, um, you got some great surgical technique videos. These are really nicely done. So if you have uh, OTA online access, you can check out this video. Uh, this is actually just a screenshot here. I cannot play it in the slide deck for you, unfortunately. Post your approaches. So the posterior approach can really get you extensile exposure to the humeral shaft. Uh, there are a few different ways to do it. Uh, there is the deltoid split. There are some um, paratricipital approaches you can do as well. So here you can see an example of the posterior approach. The patient's going to be prone or lateral. And you're going to, uh, in this case, um, in this case, they're actually... Um, demonstrating a split and the uh, radial nerve is going to be directly in your field. So with all the posterior approaches, this is going to give you great exposure to the radial nerve, whether you would like that or not. Um, and you certainly need to make sure that you fully expose the radial nerve. So the tricep split approach, and this is a, an old paper, but um, it gets referenced a lot and you can certainly look up the original paper to See the uh, drawings here, but the Gerwin Hotchkiss uh, paper describes um, sort of this uh, extensile paratricipital of reflecting approach. So the tricep split approach gives you good exposure uh, to the 55% of the posterior humeral diaphysis. You can also get some exposure all the way distally to the articular surface. Um, if you release the lateral intermuscular septum and mobilize the radial nerve, you can get a little bit more. Um, and if you elevate the um, triceps completely, you can expose um, pretty much all the way up to the axillary nerve. So here's an example, transverse fracture of the mid diaphysis fixation with a traditional uh, open reduction internal fixation through a posterior approach. And you can see that's how your lateral x-ray would look. Um, here's slightly more complex sort of distal third fracture. And here you can see fixation with a um, supplementary plate there, lag screw fixation, and a posterior lateral sort of angled plate, allowing you to get fixation all the way down onto the um, distal segment. As you can see, if you use the straight plate here, you might run right into the olecranon fossa. So some of these sort of hockey stick shaped plates allow you to um, extend your fixation all the way distally. Here's an example, 34-year-old male, right-hand dominant, segmental right distal third humeral shaft fracture with uh, some non-displaced intraarticular extension. So posterior approach, uh, this is a great approach for the distal part of the diaphysis. 
Um, so, you know, if you have a distal third fracture, you're usually not going to go anterolateral. Um, you're going to expose the nerve, mobilize the nerve. You can see lag screw fixation. Uh, and then after you've compressed everything, you're going to do a neutralizing plate. And uh, because of the very distal extent of the fracture and a need for fixation medially, you can see a separate sort of periarticular plate medially as well. Um, so ota.org and uh, go to OTA online. Uh, if you don't have your membership, you can um, get that and view, again, some great videos here. This is by Dr. Tornetto looking at uh, posterior approaches to the humeral shaft. A few words about lateral approach. So the lateral approach also gives you direct sort of uh, exposure of the radial nerve um, and of course, because you're doing that, there's some higher risk for iatrogenic damage as well. But uh, this, the gr good thing about this is supine positioning. So if you have a polytrauma patient, for example, or a patient that it's just going to be tough to really get in the lateral position safely or um, prone position, uh, then you can do this. And you just got to expose the radial nerve. You're going between the uh, sort of anterior and posterior muscle groups as shown here. So you really don't have to do a lot of muscle splitting. Um, and it is somewhat extensile, so it's not quite used as much anymore um, as it maybe used to. Uh, but it's a good, it's it's a good approach. You get good exposure. Just you know, the radial nerve is in your field the whole way. Medial approaches, you aren't going to see a whole lot of um, you know the nearby neurovascular structures are of course at risk. Um, it's not. It's, 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 it's the difficult exposure of the shaft, and it's rarely used for fixation. This is a case where perhaps um, if your vascular surgery colleagues are doing a vascular repair um, and have full exposure of the uh, brachial artery, and um, you, know, you, need, you need to fix the fracture, and here's your exposure. I mean, that's a time where you might want to consider uh, plating medially. Intramedullary nailing. All right, so I think we're going to pause here and uh, we'll pick up uh, with uh, intramedullary nailing in the next video. Uh, thanks.